uh, we are going to sing first the chorus of this song. I want you guys to learn it and get prepared because at the end of the class we're going to sing the whole song and I want you guys to be prepared to sing the chorus part of it. So this is how, now the name of this class is Cape of Love. So this song is called Cape of Love. So this is how it goes. I'm only going to do it once by myself and afterwards you guys got to help me out, okay? It goes like this. Put on your cape of love, swoop down. Put on your cape of love. Reverse a frown, how could I forget? Yeah, <laughs> reverse a frown. Put on your cape of love. Were you in the last class? Well, good job, man. <laughs> All right, so can you do it with me? Put on your cape of love, swoop down. Put on your cape of love, reverse a frown. Put on your cape of love. All right, so get prepared for that. We'll, uh, sing that later on now can anyone tell me even though we're out here and there's light out here we can see um, it's beautiful God made this earth he is obviously the maker of it um, he obviously made you know brilliant amazing beautiful things to catch our eyes but can anyone tell me who is the actual master of the earth Who's, who's the master right now on this earth? God made God made the earth, but right now, who has control or has power over the earth right now? Obama. <laughs> Obama. What's up, bud? Oh, go ahead, bud. Humans, kind of, sort of. We're we're getting there. Let me let me read a scripture. Oh, go ahead, bud. Satan. That's right. I don't know how many of you uh, knew that or aware of that, but right now, until God establishes his kingdom through Christ for all of eternity, Satan right now has dominion and power and control over this world. 2 Corinthians 4 says, 4-4, four, four, says the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. And then another one from 1 John 5 says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world right now is under the control of the evil one. And what is Satan? Satan is the opposite of God, the opposite of Christ. He's the opposite of light. What's the opposite of light? Darkness. And we are, we are amongst, regardless of how bright it is right now, we are in darkness right now, or at least unbelievers are amongst darkness right now. So if it was what? That is very true. But even regardless of whether it's night or not, as long as we're living here on this earth, we are in Satan's domain, which is darkness. Now listen to this scripture from 1 John 2. It says, anyone who claims to be in the light, but hates a brother or a sister, is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. There's nothing in them to make them stumble in this dark world. So there's darkness, whether you like it or not. It's here because Satan has dominion and power control over it. But if you love your brothers and sisters, there's nothing in you. There, there's nothing that's going to cause you to stumble in this darkness. But anyone who hates a brother or a sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They don't know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. So, when I read that, I thought, all right, it sounds like, well, first of all, this whole, you know, one thing that, that you know, really motivates people to do things sometimes because of our kind of selfish, self-centered nature is we want to know what's in it for me. Why should I do this whole Jesus thing? Why should I do these youth rallies? Why should I go to church? Why should I try to be a good person? What's in it for me? Well, what I see in here is, if the truth is, and that the truth is clear, that this is Satan's dominion right now, and that it's, it, this is darkness, well, I know that that is true, and if that's true, what would I rather have in darkness? Would I rather have, you guys tell me, what kind of tool would you rather have in darkness? Would you rather have a flashlight or a knife? Your phone, which can be a flashlight. Why would you rather have a knife? 
Unless you have one of those really flashlights, still. Yeah, them out. but I can hurt someone much more. Who would prefer to have a flashlight and why? Caitlin, uh, right? Caitlin, sorry. Uh, I prefer to have a flashlight because, you know, what's the point in having a knife if you can't see what you're <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. love is a flashlight, hate is a knife. Think about which one you carry on a daily basis in this dark world. If you carry hate within you, you're carrying with you a murder weapon. You might be able to defend yourself with the knife, flailing it all around in the darkness because you really don't know who's coming at you at absolutely any time. So you're just going to be flailing that thing everywhere, <laughs> spinning around, and thank God I didn't fall. Um, however, in that process, you're likely going to accidentally cut yourself. You're going to create enemies. You're likely going to get stabbed yourself. With a flashlight, though, you can not only see where you're going, but you can spot all those who have the knives. You can spot all those that have the hate. Remember, the knives represent the hate. You can spot, the, or spot those who would harm you, and you can intentionally stay away from them. Do we take both? Not in this particular case, but I'll create another game sometime. Later. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Either that, or you can also use your flashlight to invite these people along with those knives, make them want to drop those knives, and follow along with you in the light. They would probably much rather enjoy walking in that light, not needing their knife, than stumbling around in the darkness and gripping onto their knife as the only thing that could possibly save them. 1 Peter 5.8 says this, and this scares me and frightens me even more when I think about being in the darkness. <coughs> 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So not only is it darkness in this world, if we have hate with one another, if we don't have love, but we've got our enemy out there, a lion, who I believe, part of the cat family, they can see in the dark, right? They can see in the dark. They can find you. They can hunt you down. And you're not prepared. You don't know. Yes. Yes. You don't have to ask me. If you need to use the restroom, just go and come back, please. <laughs> um, if you are not prepared, then that lion is going to and it's going to devour you. So, everyone knows that love, love is more than just a word, right? Isn't it something that we hear, I like that, hold on to that for a second and say that again. Isn't it something that we hear overused in society today? I don't know about you guys, but I get on Facebook and there's nothing wrong with this at all, but people are often saying, oh, I love you, sis, or I love you, brother, or, or good job, you're so pretty, you're so beautiful, I love you. You know, they're saying, I love you all the time. But did you guys know, or, or let me ask you, how many times, how many times did God or Jesus in the Bible say the words, I love you, those three words? Does anyone know? Once or twice? Okay. There are actually, very close there, there are actually virtually zero times that I've been able to find in the Bible where God or Jesus actually used the words, I love you. God does once in Isaiah by telling the whole nation of Israel, all the 12 tribes of Israel, that he loves them. But wait, we sing the song, Jesus loves you all the time. He's got to love us, right? But he never said it. So how can it be true? How do we know he loves us? That's right. And, and how? How do we know that he's real? How do we know that he loves us? We believe it, but he showed it to us, right? He showed it when he was in this world through actions. And we're going to talk about those actions a little bit more in a moment. So you guys, if love is an action word, if love, you know, you have to have action to really show someone that you love them, do you guys think hate is an action word? Yeah. Who here says the phrase, I know I say it a lot, I don't hate anybody? Anyone say that to themselves, kind of? I, I don't dislike, as Jason might say, but I don't hate anybody. Well, that might be true. You might say to yourself, well, I don't hate anybody, but... Do you hate people by your actions? Are there things that you're doing, choices that you're making, things that you're saying that could possibly be showing your brothers and sisters, your friends, 
those who, sh who you should be friends to, but maybe you're not, that maybe you have hate for them. So let me ask you all, we know a lot of the ways in which we can show love to another person. What are ways that we can maybe even unintentionally show hate to someone else, intentionally or unintentionally? Avoiding them, ignoring them. Emily? Not listening to them. Not listening to them. Yep. What else? That's right. Exactly. Did you guys hear that? He said, not sharing the word with them, depriving them of God. Well, listen to the scripture in 2 Timothy 3. It says, but mark this, and, and as you guys are listening to this, I want you to think about a couple things. I want you to first of all think of, have I done any of these things? Do I commit any of these things in my daily life with the people that I'm around, uh, surrounded by? Think about those that, that might identify with these things, and also think about the world and the society that we're in, and see whether or not you can identify or you can picture and see these kinds of things in the world today. 2 Timothy 3 says, but mark, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, they'll be boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That is a multitude of adjectives to describe how someone can live out hate. When put that way, can any of you guys say when you examine yourself that you might do any of those things? You know, the Facebook is something that's being talked about a lot, but I see a lot of slander on Facebook. It is almost cool, it is almost funny to call out somebody else and make fun of them to all of your Facebook friends. Sometimes it may be people that aren't even on your friends list. Maybe you're making fun of a, you know, a celebrity or something you saw on the news or whatever it may be. A kid in school, it doesn't matter, but it is cool and it's almost funny. You want to make people laugh for those things that you try to say bad about them. Well, that is slander. There's even TV shows that are all about how can I slander someone? How can I just totally destroy them? We think about the roasts that they have of people where they get up and just make fun of people terribly. That is what, that's why we're in this, this dark world and that's a good example of how we're in this dark world. So let's listen to some of these definitions of these words and you guys think about whether or not you do any of this. To be boastful is to put one, puff oneself up in speech, assert with excessive pride, call attention to oneself. I want all the attention shine the light on me to be proud to have excessive self-esteem exalting oneself above another feeling superior over them feeling like you are better than other people <laughs> abusive harsh insulting language which we see everywhere every day in society amongst our peers physically injuring someone else these are remember these are all things in which we can show hate ungrateful, showing no gratitude, rude, thoughtless, ungracious, slanderous, the utterance of false charges or misrepresentations that defame and damage another person's character. It, you're intentionally trying to make someone look bad just so you can make yourself look better. Without self-control, you're impulsive, you are led by your emotions, you don't think before you go and do stuff, you don't hold yourself back from losing your temper. You're brutal, grossly ruthless or unfeeling, cruel, cold-blooded, harsh, treacherous, betraying someone's trust, being unreliable, an unreliable friend, untrue or unfaithful. Let's see what the Bible says who by action hate a brother or a sister. So those who demonstrate all the things we just talked about, what do you think the Bible says about that? 1 John 4.20 says, Whoever claims, and I really love that word claims there, it goes right to the heart of our whole theme here. It's friend or foe. So though you might say, I love God, but there's many of those who claim they love God but don't show it. So it says, whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother, does all these things we just talked about, or a sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, 
cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And 1 John 3.11 says, For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We know that we have passed from death to life. Because why? Because we were righteous? Because we obeyed all the commandments? We checked off the list? We went to church every Sunday? Is that how we get into the gates of heaven? What do you guys think the next line is? We know that we pass from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. They remain in that darkness. Anyone who hates a brother or a sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Even though you may not physically kill someone, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that just hating a brother, just saying something evil or bad about a brother or a sister is just like killing them, just like murder. What's that? Exactly. So how can you guys stand out? How can you make a difference? If the world's going to know that we are Christians by our love, how can we love profoundly? You are not his child and you do not know him if you don't love your brother and sister. Can anyone tell me where in the Bible it gives us a very long, beautiful list, though, of all the action words that represent love? Beatitudes, that's very good. That, that's awesome, but I'm not quite like not quite thinking of that one. Love is Exactly. It's used in weddings all the time. It's 1 Corinthians 13. So here are some of the attributes that are talked about in 1 Corinthians 13. And I want you guys, again, examine. Does it, did anyone understand and get the whole magnifying glass thing on this? No. That is to, what is a magnifying glass used for? To see the nitty gritty details that you can't see with the naked eye. Look at yourself. Examine yourself and get right down to those nitty gritty details that you don't want to have exposed, that you don't want to reveal, that you don't even want to admit yourself is inside of you. Use that magnifying glass as we, as we talk about what love is right now and, and ask yourself whether or not you're, you're doing these things. So love is patient. That means it doesn't get agitated. It doesn't get frustrated. It it's, doesn't get all ruffled and roused up and excitable. Love is kind. It's not bitter. It's not cruel. It doesn't intentionally try to defame somebody. It doesn't envy. I had never thought about that before. So if love means I don't envy, that, that means if I'm being envious of someone, I must have hate in my heart. So, man, I mean, I remember being, being beat up a lot as a kid and being bullied as a kid and made fun of a lot. And I remember looking at different people thinking, man, I want to be like them. I wish I looked like them. I wish I dressed like them. I wish I had the friends that they had. I wish I was as good at basketball as they were because then maybe I wouldn't be made fun of as much. And I was envious, envious of them and jealous and wanting what they had. That's not love. Love is not proud. It does not boast. It doesn't dishonor others, abuse or de degrade each other. Let me ask you guys, when Jesus was here, did he not have just a billion and one reasons to dishonor us, to defame us? Didn't he? When he was here on this earth, why didn't God send him with a whip and say, Oh my gosh, I've given you four, five, six thousand years, however long it was, and I've given you my commands and, and I've, I've blessed you beyond measure time and time again. I've saved you out of stuff. What is going on with you people? He could make fun of us. He could totally just beat us down. But no, what did he do instead? He used that magnifying glass and he found the beautiful things inside of us and he pulled those things out. And he made us feel special. Even though we weren't there here on this earth, we have an account of what he did. And that is what we live by to this day. So even though there may be a billion and one reasons why when you look at someone, you can make fun of them, you can defame them, it's your job as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, as a real follower of Jesus, to find those beautiful things and point them out and, and share those things with others rather than the opposite. Love is not self-seeking. 
every self word that you can think of, self-absorbed, self-admiring, self-centered, self-important, self-involved, all of those self words, love is not that. In fact, I thought of what I think is a good definition for what a friend is versus what a foe is. A friend is, it's all about you, or it's, it's all about me, right? How others compliment me, how others help shine a light on me, help others bring attention to me, how they give me glory and fame and how they make me feel good and they give me what I want. That's fakeness. That's a foe. Do any of you guys have friends like that in your life? Do you? Where you feel like, like you like still kind of hanging around with them because they're cool, because they get a lot of attention from other people, but you know if you're really honest with yourself that that person doesn't really like you? that that person is really just all about themselves and they want you to make them look better, that's a fake friend. So if a fake friend is all about themselves, what's a real friend? All about Jesus. All about Jesus, which what was Jesus all about? Others, that's right. So a real friend is, it's all about them, how you serve them, how you love them, how you forgive them, how you make them feel good, how you make them feel accepted. How does the world treat its friends? We are supposed to be called out of the world. How do you treat your friends? They ought to differ greatly. When you look around the world and you see how they are treating other people, the way you treat everybody else in your life ought to be a stark difference from them. In 1 John 3.18, it says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Jesus showed us at one particular passage in the Bible um, that he doesn't care about our lip service. He doesn't care about our speech, about our talk. In a conversation that he had with Peter, does anybody remember the conversation Jesus had with Peter that just flustered Peter so much? What was that? You were in the earlier class, weren't you? <laughs> I'm sorry you have to listen to me again. What was it? Uh, we were at the, well, they were on the place and they said, Jesus asked me three times, uh, do you love me? And then he said, yes. And then he asked me the second time, he said, yes, I love you. And then after the third time, he said, yes, you know, why did you do that? That's right, that's right. So Jesus is having a conversation with Peter, and just as he said, Jesus is like, do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, I love you. You know, G Peter's thinking these, are, these words are what matters the most. I just need to tell Jesus I love him. And he's like, no, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I, I stink and love you, Lord. What do you want from me? No, but do you really love me? That is a great example of how you are not going to be able to convince God that you love him by your words. I talked about this in the previous class, but I don't know if you guys do this. I do this. In my prayers, ever since I was young, you know, I have always, always said, close my prayers with, I love you, God. I love you so much, God. Even after I've sinned, even after I've been, you know, just begging to God for forgiveness, I almost am trying to convince God, hey, I love you. Even though I did all this, even though I walked the wrong path, even though I did these wrong things, I love you. What do you think God was saying back? Derek, will you just prove it to me? Will you just show me that you really love me instead of trying to convince me with words? Um, in 1 Corinthians, and this is another example of just how meaningless our words are. 1 Corinthians 4, 20 says this. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. Aren't we really, really consumed with speech in this life? With speech and with talk and with, with fancy words and with, you know, convincing someone how, what, you know, what is right or what we believe or what we think by our words. Just words matter so much in this day and age. But God is saying, my kingdom, my kingdom of heaven is not all about talk. When you guys are up in these beautiful streets of gold, we're not going to be up there going, oh, hey, doesn't your hair look beautiful today? Oh, I really, really love you. Oh, aren't you just 
you know, great and this, 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 and that. No, he's saying that's not what his kingdom of God is going to be about. His kingdom of God is going to be about action. It's going to be about power, and there is power in really acting his love out. You know, someone say something? I thought I heard a voice over here. I'm sorry, but <laughs> um, I was thinking that you know when I, when trying to trying to motivate and trying to help you guys understand if and you may already just the need to love I was thinking a lot of guys are like well love is just such a mushy word and I can't see myself going out there and saying hey guys Jesus loves you God loves you I love you come to church with me you know come learn about him it's hard for us to be some guys to be mushy like that you don't have to be there's power in not being like that there's power and simply loving like Jesus did. And that's where the Cape of Love song comes in. Um, it might sound a little cheesy, but I was hoping that you all might think when you go out here, and it might sound like it's not very serious, but it, sometimes it helps me to be able to think of an analogy, to paint a word picture of something that, that helps me be able to, to deal with life and stay closer to God and Christ. I want you all to picture yourselves for Jesus, a superhero for Jesus. One who, when the world is dark, when the world is cold, when the world is ugly, when it treats other people in all these adjectives that we talked about here, that you guys choose to be the opposite, that you guys choose to love. So, are you guys ready to hear the rest of the song? Okay, you gotta help me out. Do you remember the chorus? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna sing it again real quick. You guys sing it with me just so we have the chorus. Put on your cape of love, swoop down. Put on your cape of love, reverse a frown. Put on your cape of love. All right, so here it goes. And I'm really just gonna speak this. So, and I'm no Eminem, so it's not gonna be like, fantastic. In the name of fun, they're tormenting him. He's an easy target, can't really defend. Looking your way, they wait for you to join in. And that's when you put on your cape of love, swoop down. Put on your cape of love, reverse a frown. Put on your cape of love. They smile to her face, whisper when she turns, but she hears what they say, those words, how they burn. You begin to move your lips when you put on your cape of love, swoop down. Put on your cape of love, reverse a frown. Put on your cape of love. You're wearing your trendy clothes, feeling mighty purdy. Others are lacking style, looking kind of nerdy. It's easy to feel higher, peering down on them like a birdie. You start to puff up, but instead you put on your cape of love, swoop down. Put on your cape of love, reverse a frown. Put on your cape of love. Thank you very much. Yes. Like make a video. Make a video of that? Yeah. Alright, as long as I'm not in it, that's totally cool. Uh, I know how to do these breaks We need we need like a cape with a big L word on it or something. Yeah. So. Like, like a heart. It's yeah. Halloween, you still There you go. Exactly. Thank you all very much. Thank you for listening. Participate.